and thank you for joining us in Mapping the Zone, a podcast dedicated to informal discussion of the works and context of Thomas Pynchon. We are following the reading schedule from the Pynchon subreddit, and today we are discussing chapters 26 through 30 of Mason and Dixon. Uh, Will, do you have a summary for us? I do. So here as we start uh, the America section of Mason and Dixon. We are welcome to America with an excerpt from the Pennsylvania ad by Timothy Talks and introduced to the coast of Delaware only briefly as our surveyors spend the night before going along to Philadelphia the next day. They're certainly overwhelmed by the displays in the street of innocent flirtation blending with predatory con, the stands of patent medicine vials turning to the latest invented gadgets and even spiritual salvation for sale. Quakers themselves are publicly evangelizing. This inspires a diversion in the Lispark parlor, with the Reverend doing his best to transport his family back to the Great Awakening as though he had been there. It evolves into a discussion on the nature of social upheavals, focused particularly on the lens of music. Aunt Euphrania and Ethelmer trade turns demonstrating their divergent opinions on recent melodic trends, culminating in a rough foreshadowing of rock and roll termed surf music by Depew. Meanwhile, Wick's cherry coke finds Ethelmer's lack of faith disturbing. It turns out one of the first tasks to be done in Philadelphia is to procure sufficient quantities, that is, enormous amounts, of laxative and costive elixirs for the purposes perhaps not listed on the labels. There, in the apothecary, the titled duo happen upon a Mr. Benjamin Franklin. The noted aphorist dispenses some advice in the ways of evading the prying eyes of the commissioners as well as overspending before inviting them to his local coffee house. While Mason and Dixon are alternately distracted by some manner of watch salesman in the alley, Franklin tries to prey upon the mild paranoia which lies between them. He unveils Dixon's Jesuit connection to Mason and drills for peach info in Dixon. The former plays petulant, the latter dumb. When reunited, Franklin gives his opinion on the matter of the seahorse, which he'd been present in the, in the Royal Society meetings regarding. He shows respect for the members individually, but believes that the sorry destination for the Paris transit of Venus observations was the natural outcome of the group's constant bickering and vanity, not to be advised by underlings. He analogizes this to the general reasons for antipathy against England in the colonies. The polymath's command of the conversation slips as two of his students make their arrival, both dolled up like a pair of 18th century juicy couture connoisseurs. They distract him sufficiently for the astronomers to convene and acknowledge the strangeness of this man they've heard so much about. They are invited to, and attend, Franklin's Glass Harmonica concert that evening at a melancholy dive. At intermission, he introduces them to a man who directs them to visit Colonel George Washington and hires them a literal non-stop literal coach to drive them straight through the night to the base of Mount Vernon. The Colonel surprises them too, though less than Franklin. They sit around discussing the work of surveying and commerce as Washington dispenses his practical and business tips. He ridicules their willingness to give away so much free work in the form of the plant marked line. He points to the burgeoning pioneers ready to travel and state claims and clear out the current inhabitants who stand in their way, even indicates a piece of land they may want to invest in so they can take advantage of this opportunity for themselves. Just as he warns that just as he warns them not to identify themselves as adherents to anything less theistic than deism, Dixon notices a certain pungent odor. Upon the voicing of this, Washington causes for, calls for his right-hand manservant, Gershon, to pack them a few pipefuls of their latest hemp flapper. Something about their dynamics distresses Dixon. Apparently quite an entertainer, Gershon joins in on the sesh, tells jokes, warns Dixon and Mason of the dangers they may encounter west of the Alleghenies. Soon, in comes Martha, bearing a basket full of pastries for the lot of them, and some household grievances to embarrass her husband with. Dixon talks politics and private warfare with the men while Mason is busy justifying star science to her. Perhaps she is less than interested, as her next move is to stop up Mason's mouth with as much, possible, as, much as possible with myriad tarts. Eventually, it all comes back together at the subject of the transit of Venus. It seems something akin to what the astronomers witnessed in Cape Town may have transpired in this colony as well, and the Washingtons perform a saccharine duet dedicated to the mobility of the goddess's planet. They joke and chat, and eventually comes up the subject of the French means of laying claim to water sources, burying engraved lead plates at the mouths of streams. They wonder at the purpose, but Washington takes it for mundane despite Dixon's electromania. When he produces one of the plates revealing Chinese script on the back, Dixon has once again assumed a Jesuit associate. 
he dodges he dodges the label by pulling out a Masonic code phrase, which immediately disarms the colonel. When they return to Philadelphia, Franklin bemoans the secrecy of the Jesuit engineers, yearning to understand and utilize their photonic telegraph machines. They spend a few days as tourists, waiting for contracts above their heads to be finalized and orders to be filled. Mason visits every museum of morbidity he can find, including a wax statue maker's, whose lifelikeness leaves him disturbed and paranoid. They stop in on every secret society they can find, usually only rewarded with a standard drink and gameplay. Some of those faces Mason saw in the museum appear too in these back rooms, and he begins to worry about how many real people had been watching him in that place. The worst comes when they meet the commissioners to finalize plans, where he sees that the whole of them had been there. Or, rather, the sculptor's practice pieces modeled on them had been. Unable to sleep, he wanders into a pub, and is told by an unnamed speaker how religion and politics were welded in the New World. He is unsure how to take this until Benjamin Franklin appears on stage, dressed as death, urging everyone to line up, join hands, and shock themselves with this battery of Leyden jars. He leads the dancing crowd into the street after ominously acknowledging Mason. Finally, all official mat matters set settled, the commissioners venture to the wall, chosen rather uh, arbitrarily, which they've chosen to anoint as the southernmost point in Philadelphia. Around them, the neighborhood jokes about how it'll only be days before a new southern point is established. Nearby, the construction crew builds a small observatory, and they chatter about the bizarre specifications of the small tower. Dixon finds himself in a cafe frequented mainly by the magnetically minded, and finds it very familiar. There, he sees one of Benjamin Franklin's students, Dolly, dressed down for once. They speak for a while, bonding over their friendships to depressives, particularly the mandatory cheek soreness, as well as their mutual interest in invisible worlds, Dixon's subterranean and Dolly's spectral. She warns the Geordie. People are assuming he has mystical abilities when it comes to metals, including some of their commissioners. Don't disappoint. All right, thank you for that. And um, I totally forgot to do our introductions at the beginning, so I apologize for that. My name is Cody. I am one of the co-hosts here. I'm Will. And I am Kate. Uh, unfortunately, Luke could not join us uh, for this session, so um, hopefully he'll be back with us next time. Um, we'll definitely uh, miss his input on these chapters, but um, we will carry on the three of us. Um, so to start, how, how did everyone feel about these, these first chapters of Part 2? I think these chapters in Part 2 might be to most people's eyes, at least in my opinion, some of the most Pinchonian stuff we've read so far, like the combination of, you know, cultural critique with the stuff being referenced in, in, in the 60s changing, which we'll get into probably pretty early, to the, you know, immaculate descriptions of the harbor on the East Coast, and then also the appearance of real life, um, you know, members of American history before sort of their most famous portions of history had taken place and how Pinchon takes like real elements of their life and sort of twists them either in humorous ways or to suit his his plot needs. I think um, if there was a part of the book so far that I would kind of pitch as as being particularly Pinchonian, this this section of chapters, I think, would really stand out to me. It's a lot of table setting, of course, because it's it's when Mason and Dixon are first in in the United States, and they're they're getting used to seeing what this this you know system of colonies looks like and where they're going to be for a while. But that doesn't keep uh, Pinchon from from becoming gleefully absurd uh, with a lot of the things that go on in these five chapters. Yeah, in a lot of ways, this is almost my favorite section of the book, at least so far. Between the absurd scenes with these founding fathers who. Are all of them, all of them, even the ones that show up later, are basically like weird amalgams of their real historical selves, and then like the propagandized versions. It, it's just so. Um, in particular, Benjamin Franklin has such a an intense bizarreness to him that it's mm -hmm. very hard mm -hmm. to not uh, just find this whole section enchanting. <laughs> Yeah, I remember in in reading it, it it felt while I was reading it like nothing much was really happening as far as as far as plot really, 
but the more I really started thinking about it and, and thinking about the things I wanted to talk about, I was realizing like there, there's really, you know, as you both said, there's so much of what makes Pinchon Pinchon in these five chapters. Um, and y'all have, I mean, already covered that pretty well. Um, so I, yeah, I really enjoy it. Um, it's, it really, you know, makes me want more and, and it was hard to really just kind of stop myself after the five chapters that we're talking about here. Um, but it just it reminded me as as often he does with with everything he writes about why I love his work so much. Just the the idiosyncrasies that he has uh, scattered throughout each of these chapters that just makes his voice so unique amongst you know all the all the writers that have tried to do anything like this and and what sets him apart from really everyone else. Yeah, very much so, and especially you know once again. Going back to one of the things that we've mentioned in a lot of episodes, both with Lot 49 and this, like the the amount of research he would have had to have done to include the small details about Ben Franklin or George Washington that are true, such as George Washington having a field full of, you know, marijuana crop uh, mm -hmm. or hemp or hemp crop, as it's it's, it's specifically described. Yeah. Um, I don't know how how widely known that would have been to the average person in 1997. I feel like. Yeah. There, there's a lot of more instances in which not just you know what might have been being sold on the on the Philadelphia Harbor or you know what was true about these these particular historical figures he's pulling upon. I don't know how widely people would have known about that. And so there's there's almost a a, a double layer of of humor or absurdity there, where you know on one level, if you're someone who has no knowledge of of these real life aspects of history. You read it and you laugh and you appreciate it for one thing, but if you're someone who also has learned that either as a result of reading this book or, or due to you know reading actual history and other sources, like it, it, there's another layer of of real entertainment and seeing how he takes those elements and twists them to to suit the the reality of what he's writing as opposed to to actual history. Yeah, and so i want to i want to start at the at the beginning really um with the opening poem that's in here the the that's credited to timothy talks um and i correct me if i'm wrong here i i believe the timothy talks um references here is is a, a reference to john barth specifically the the sotweed factor um, you are correct which, yeah Okay, so that that's a book that i have been meaning to read for the longest time and just have not gotten around to doing it um, but I've heard that uh, I've heard of a lot of the parallels between it and this book, and so that's kind of what's piqued my interest in wanting to read it. But yeah, that was my understanding was Timothy Talks was a reference back to that. Yeah, so there was uh, historically there was a, a a British American poet named Ebenezer Cook who published a poem called "The Sotweed Factor" or "A Voyage to Maryland: A Satire," um, which is essentially just a I mean, it, it's a lot. From what I understand, I haven't read it. It's a lot like the sections of Timothy Talks we have in this book. And the John Barth uh, Sotweed Factor novel is basically taking Ebenezer Cook's poorly documented life and fleshing it out into a, a picaresque in the same way that this is for Mason and Dixon. Mm. So this book definitely owes a lot to Barth in that way. So, but yeah, in, in that opening poem, um, I really... I, I I went back and read it a couple times just because it really I, I felt like there was a lot going on in that in that little bit um, and specifically the last two lines kind of I thought spoke to the um, the inevitability of of change and of um, of the way that we as people change the land both physically and metaphorically with you know things like territorial lines. Um, but just the last two lines, that sharing a fate directed by the stars to mark the earth with geometric scars. Um, I just, you know, it, it, I think reading it the first time is what made those two lines is what made me go back and reread that poem a couple of times is just to really take it all in. Yeah. Which I, I like your, your turn of phrase there with either how the, how we change the land or the land changes us. Cause that's very accurate to what we've already seen take place on Helena where that is a, a mm -hmm. very specific reference to the idea that this this island because of the the wind or the inescapability of it or the the constant pounding from from waves something in the land seems to to drive people crazy um keeping that in mind as we enter into america and certainly as we 
because even to Mason and Dixon, a lot of the the historical figures they encounter right away seem incredibly different to everything that they're familiar with, and that there is something about the land that they're going to come out and and mark, you know, with with a scar upon the earth, like it it, it is already showing this idea that you know where people come from, the lands that they occupy, whether they were born there or came there you know at a later point in their life there is something within that you know equivalent exchange that that changes both both the land and the people that are occupying it it's it's a good thing to call out and it's kind of keep an eye on as we continue through the book because i would say it's a pretty big factor of how this this book thematically works out and how okay so the the opening scenes of of philadelphia um i think were among my favorite parts of what we've read so far, just the description, the way he describes the 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 city itself and the people that occupy the city, um, it's it's something we've talked about before. His his ability to, you know, breathe life into these uh, these settings, much more so. Not and again, I don't want to say that you know his early work doesn't have that that ability because I do think he has a lot of um, really beautiful imagery and and world building elements in his early work but i think with with mason and dixon and against the day it's on full display and and we get that from you know this opening scene in philly and 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 the way we're introduced to the town and and they're going through and, and seeing all these different street vendors and and you know the people in the way that mason and dixon are dressed it just was so evocative and and powerful and such a great way to open this this second section of the book yeah, absolutely. Because there is a quality to those descriptions. And I do agree with you in that it's some of my favorite stuff we've read so far. It's certainly my favorite section of these five chapters from a standpoint of its writing quality. But there is something in how he lays all of that out that very cleverly illustrates to the reader that this is a different location and that it's a unique location, that there are things about it that are different from from other places and he's done that with every single place that mason and dixon have gone to over the the 200 pages that we've gone through already um but there is something in his description and in his sort of laying out of this landscape and and what they've come to that feels particularly unique when compared to a lot of the other descriptions that we get of england or um you, you know the, the different colonies that they visited prior to this in that there is it's something in in the energy of how he describes the the docks and the seaside marketplace and all of that that really does sell this idea that this is a place in in a way of business and of intense like hustle and bustle everybody has sort of a a scheme that they're working on or some sort of self-interest that they're trying to 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 bring to fruition and then of course he kind of rounds it out with when they when they are speaking to to Franklin for the first time Franklin's trying to figure out, you know, what side Mason and Dixon are on and, and, and mm -hmm. what they might represent and how he might be able to play them off against one another. It's this idea of like a place of grand commerce and and I guess really capitalism, if we want to get down to it, that he gets across very cleverly in these opening paragraphs that really struck me this time reading the book. Yeah, up until this point, whenever we've been introduced to a setting, it's it's been introduced with these, uh, I'm going to say spiritual, I don't think that's quite the right term, but the, the, these holistic, these, uh, you know, old world associated terms, this this mystical kind of lens um, that, that blends well with his general tone of surreality. That, that has, that, that's what is coding all of his other descriptions of locations. But the moment we get past Delaware, we enter into... Um, into into philadelphia it just immediately drops all of that and we have people just transparently making sales pitches and <laughs> cynically <laughs> endeavoring to spread their religion it, it feels much more much more socially real than the rest of the book so far by a long yeah. shot yeah it's it has a very uh a very cinematic feel i think um yeah and, you can and, visualize it really well yeah, exactly. And I think Will, you were you were right in describing the earlier um descriptions of of the the towns and cities that we were in um had a different 
a different vibe, I guess, for for lack of a better word. And it's almost a a complete 180 when we get to uh, to Philadelphia, which I think is interesting. I, I think it's you know it, it's on the one hand you know it it kind of it does show the the capitalistic kind of society that's being built here, um, and it's in its early stages. But it's also just such a a stark contrast to what we were used to getting with with the towns uh, that we've been in 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 previous chapters. Yeah, and in some way, I wonder if that isn't to some extent what people are identifying when they talk about this book losing its dialect as you get further into it. Because objectively, if you sit down and analyze the writing, it does not become easier to read in terms of no. like, language compared to modern dialects. But mm -hmm. it does, at this point, drop a lot of the facade of like larger than lifeness. It just it, it just breaks down into oh now this is just a book in America, I guess. Yeah, it's. I don't want to say it. It loses a a sense of magic. I think it, that maybe there was a sense of mysticism that existed in the in the earlier towns. Um, yeah. and and that's gone. That kind of that veil has been lifted, uh, so to speak. So it. Definitely is a, a tonal shift in, in a way. Well, I think, too, the difference is, is, you know, established history. Like, Mason and Dixon are coming from, you know, England, which is, at this point, the, the, the throne of the, the greatest yeah. empire on the planet Earth. This place that has, uh, you know, all of this history, all of these different wars that it's fought, all of these different, you know, inventions that it's come up with, all these different movements in language and art. You know, they encounter... France in the, in the early chapters when they they get attacked by the 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 grand and that has the same associations with it when they go down to to the colonies in South Africa and you know that region there's a similar sense of of sort of elongated history there and and colonialism and all of that where you know it, it would make sense for these people to have more of a tie to the place that they come from more of a tie to either the mysticism or, or potentially you know, a grasp on on some some older modalities when it comes to to speaking or relating. But as soon as you go to a place that is fairly new, as far as the people that are living there, obviously the land itself is as old as anything else. But the society they're stepping into is is new, and it's so separated from the rest of the empire as far as its distance that uh, the idea that there wouldn't be a difference there um, would be pretty foolish and the fact that Pinchon understands that recognizes that and then applies it in his text to the way that the reader actually experiences it is one of these moments that we talk about where we, we talk about what really separates Pinchon out from so many other authors that that operate in the world of literary fiction because you're absolutely correct there is a there is a difference in how this book reads but there isn't a difference in the type of language that he's relating it through it's still that 16th century dialect but it's a different location so therefore and a newer place so therefore it has a completely different feel as far as how it actually reads and and the way that he can do that without telegraphing it you know very explicitly to his reader is really one of those moments that that separates out Pinchon from most other authors for me. Yeah, and it, it just as a, a single example that just popped out um, to my mind, the, in the early chapters you have this scene where there were Mason's visiting Tiburn, and it, a specific phrase is uh, people dressed in nonce hats, so hats that have been made just for the one-time use. Um, and compare that to the type of archaic language in this section where it says like um already it is possible to walk the streets of new york passing among buskers and mongers it it does feel more american and it's not just because okay. that's that's an american character speaking but also the narrator changes too so let's uh i want to take a minute to talk about the uh the street vendors that we we come across um in in philly because i thought these were these were all so just so so great um so we have our there's a snake oil salesman the 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 pills balsamic uh which that one i i didn't catch that right away i had to i ended up finding that on the pinch on wiki that the pills balsamic is, a, is essentially what snake oil was at the time 
Um, we've got an aphrodisiac salesman, a guy selling flasks, uh, someone selling proper pizza. That was my favorite part, especially coming off <laughs> the last set of sections or set of chapters. Mm-hmm. Um, and then obviously you've got your evangelicals in there, um, which is, I think, such a great representation of the diversity of of what makes America America, because it really truly is kind of a. Uh, or uh, you know, at the time, especially was was such a vast um, kind of quilt of these different fabrics from different areas that were all establishing their own little independent places in these larger cities. And and over time, obviously, they you know they've blended in and and become something a little more homogenous. Although they do still have you know there is that cultural identity you know throughout different cities, but I think it was so much more drastic here. And, and, and I think this representation of all these different, um, street merchants is, is such a just fun kind of walk through, <laughs> through Philly, uh, um, in the 1760s. Yeah. I particularly appreciate that each of the speakers, each of the, the hawkers seems to have a distinct accent or dialect in some way. Mm-hmm. It's the, it's the little touches that are nice. Um, and then, uh, so I, I, I'm curious to see, uh, or to hear how y'all, uh, felt about the, the, I kind of got this feel with the way the, the evangelicals were embraced, mm-hmm. um, in this section, it felt a lot like the, the embrace of the transit of Venus, that, that kind of weird shift that happens where, where, or happened where everybody changed for a brief period of time, um, as a result of the transit kind of came back to play with this where you have all these people who, you know, quickly embrace this, this evangelical, um, form of religion. And it just kind of, you know, once it's euphoric phase has passed, it kind of, you know, the, the impact of it wears off and it's just back to normal. Yeah. I, th- what I took away from that section had more to do, um, with the fact that it is mentioned within or is rather brought up again within the context of music changing, as the book says, in the yeah. 60s. Um, which, to me, when you go through and read that whole section that's sort of an aside between Cherry Coke and, I believe it's Ethelmer, um, who are talking, they mention not just the fact that music is changing in the 60s, but also that religion moves to embrace this sort of evangelicalism also in the 60s. And to me, that stood out as significant, not so much to the transit of Venus point that you made, but that is that is a smart point. Um, but to the fact that the same thing happened in the 1960s, mm-hmm. and it felt very deliberate to me that, that Pinchon was making either a point about the cycles of history or the idea that there are these things that repeat itself you know, no matter what era that you're you're stuck in, and that you know maybe music is a cultural force that when it moves, so too does other things around it, like religion, or vice versa. When religion moves, so too does music. Because the '60s, as I'm sure nobody listening to this podcast needs to be reminded, was a massive changing moment for for music. It was mm-hmm. the beginning of a whole lot of different genres of music. A, a moment where where drugs began to be consumed very regularly by musicians to you know come up with new sounds and and there was also a whole counterculture movement that came out of that but the other aspect of it that is very important to that time period and also relevant to this section where they speak about it is it was also the rise of not tent revivals tent revivals was more so the period that we're talking about within mason and dixon and then into the 1800s but tele-evangelism Yep. And these massive preachers like Billy Graham or, you know, other contemporaries of him that would go on television or go on these massive tours around the country trying to promote a, I'll say cultural conservatism, but I don't mean that politically. I just mean from a standpoint of what we would describe as conservative when compared to, you know, the the countercultural movement of the 60s, that that felt very deliberate by by Pinchon to draw a parallel between those two things in this section. So that was what really stuck out to me about the specific mention of evangelists and evangelicalism. Because while it was around in the 1730s and 40s, it wasn't a massive thing yet. It would take about another hundred years for it to really 
develop into something more similar to what we see now. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because um, that I, th there, there's mention of a couple of musical elements that, that happened just after this that uh, I wanted to touch on. And, and uh, your, you're right on with that. I, I think that connection to the 1960s, because there is that brief mention of surf music uh, on page yeah, 264. Yeah. Um, but also the, the B flat major comes up again, um, which I think I've mentioned earlier as, as being kind of a recurring theme with him. And I found out that uh, B flat major is a very common and, and easy to use key for wind instruments and concert instruments. So it was very popular with jazz um, when that, started becoming more and more uh, a mainstream thing. And I, I 100% agree with you that um, I think music and, and history are, well, not so much history, but music, well, history too, but music and, and culture itself are kind of have a cyclical nature. And so the changes that come uh, over time and the, and the shifts in the musical zeitgeist and the cultural zeitgeist can really kind of uh, overlap with each other and, and push each other. And, and at the sixties was definitely that. Um, and I think, you know, because the 60s is where, I mean, the late 50s and early 60s, we had a lot of jazz music that was becoming popular with, with Miles Davis and Coltrane and uh, Sonny Coleman. And we know that Penchon was, you know, a very, very big, I say was, is a very, very big uh, fan of jazz. And you had a lot of that, even within jazz, you know, had, had existed for yeah, 20, 30, 40 years at that time uh, in, in the 60s. But then you have that shift into freeform jazz with, with, uh, Ornette Coleman and uh, and Coltrane and Miles Davis doing a lot more experimental work, um, and then yeah, all the all the other you know musical ideas and concepts and and experimentation that came about in that time, uh, which coincided with a time of great cultural uh, change as well. And so yeah, I think you're right on with with that idea that they move together and, and one influences the other and. Religion absolutely, I think, piggybacks on that as well. Um, yeah, and so yeah, it's it's a lot of things I think that are um, kind of condensed into this little section right here that that are being brought up and and you know we're kind of keyed into that I think at this point. Yeah, and there's a quote that if you if you don't mind me belaboring the religious history point, I just I need to use my degree for something um, <laughs> uh, where it says. Here on page 261, this is kind of the aside between Cherry Coke and Ethelmer, where it says, The new religion had crested better than 20 years before, the Reverend Cherry Coke explains. By the 60s, we were well into a descent that grew more vertiginous with the days, ever towards some great trough whose terrible depth no one knew. Or, yet knows, the intermittently gloomy Ethelmer, as so often the Reverend finds himself looking for Denebray's reactions to the thoughts of her cousin, the university man. All respect, sir. Wouldn't the scientific thing have been to keep note through the years after of those claiming rebirth in Christ? To see how they did? How long the certainty lasted? To see who was telling the truth and how much of it? Oh, there were scoundrels about, to be sure, says the Reverend, claiming falsely for the purposes of commerce, an awakening they would not have recognized had it shouted to them by name. But enough people had shared the experience that charlatans were easily exposed. That was the curious thing, so many having been through it together. The reason I want to highlight that quote to the point that I had made just a little bit ago is that that is a very specific concern to the 1960s evangelicalism, not the 1700s um, evangelicalism or 1600s yeah. evangelicalism, because you had thousands of people going and seeing Billy Graham in like these stadiums or all of these people watching televangelists from home um, claiming that they had, you know, attained rebirth in Christ today, become Christians. But what a lot of these traveling evangelists never did was tell people where to go to church. They showed up and then they preached a sermon and then they came up with this idea of the altar call that you could be converted by and then they left. And so this idea of like people being converted potentially falsely or, you know, watching them to see whether or not their conversion sticks is a very specific concern to, to what was going on 200 years later, as opposed to at the time that, that Ethelmer and, and Cherry Coke are actually debating, which I just found so clever because it's a piece of criticism that would have been, you know, contemporary to Pinchon's day. And he inserts it 
in a anachronistic context, that would still apply. Because if someone said that they were a Christian in the, in the you know, 16, 17, 1800s, you wouldn't probably have any reason to doubt what they were telling you or have any reason to, to try and test out to see if they actually were or to watch them to see if they were. You just kind of took it at face value because everybody was religious for the most part. Um, but he's reminding the reader, for someone who's aware of like the whole historical context here, that these criticisms apply you know, throughout the, the centuries prior to when they were first voiced, which I found to be particularly another aspect of these five chapters that I find insanely intelligent um, for, for him to insert in here in, in what is ultimately like three paragraphs. So yeah, the, that particular section I was actually going to quote um, because there's, there's another angle on it and it's not just the, the televangelist side of things, not just the Billy Graham side of things. It's also the, the, the hippie Christianity movement, which was a mm. thing in the 60s. And yeah. what, we, what we have to remember anytime we're talking about Wix Cherry Coke is that he's not just a reverend, he is possibly a spy, definitely an anarchist. Definitely a revolutionary in some way, shape, or form, even if he's more of a slacktivist than anything else. Um, he, he is, in some sense, a, a symbol of this, this evangelical faith fused with the, the, the uh, progressive and uh, socialist politics that a lot of the hippies ended up having in the 1960s. And yeah you can totally see the you can totally see the the televangelists like oh it's definitely all real because it had to be real if it weren't real then i wouldn't be telling you it were real what you can mm -hmm. also see there is the the old hippie vibe of yeah man you had to be there everyone who was there <laughs> knows what it was like man and i'm not saying I, I put on a little voice there and i don't mean to ridicule it but it is absolutely Absolutely. Um, this is a real thing that a lot of people feel about the 60s, that there was a real shift, that there was something real, and that, sure, there were the free love gurus who were actually just rapists, but, hey, there was real free love, too. You had to be there. Mm -hmm. Well, and especially... I... Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think we're supposed to look at those two interpretations parallel. Yeah, I agree completely. And especially, like... Because both social movements burned out so fast. Like, Billy Graham was not playing stadiums, I'll say, for an incredibly long period of time. You know, it's, it's slowly moved into the background of, like, a certain subset of the population watches these TV channels or, or attends these events. It wasn't, you know, the zeitgeist for very long. And the same thing is true of, of that hippie movement as well, where, you know, that, that faded away real quick as far as what yeah. we st stereotypically define as that um and i think both of them to your point will have this idea of like well you wouldn't understand what it was like unless you were there like you wouldn't understand what it, what it was like unless you were in a commune or you were going to you know these different concerts where were that type of movement for for music and and for free love was actually centered around same thing true from the religious side of just it feels probably much bigger than it actually was as far as its its place in history but you wouldn't understand what it actually looked like or how many people were actually invested in it for the short period of time that it was around unless you had actually seen it and anytime something reaches broad-based popularity like that you know that probably that's where it's about to end that's a somber note <laughs> Um, well, and one other thing I wanted to, to touch on regarding the, you know, the, this conversation, um, there's also the, on page 262, uh, Euphrenia is uh, talking about, there, there's that discussion of Plato's Republic and, and that when the forms of music changed is a promise of civil disorder. Uh, but then uh, Euphrenia mentions, uh, and, have you, and have you noticed the way that everything suddenly has begun to gravitate toward B-flat major? That's a sign of trouble ahead. Um, and going back to the that that idea that you know B flat major had a, a big role in jazz music at the time that jazz music was coming around, and then again with with rock music becoming popular in the '60s with the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and everything, that was you know you had all these concerned 
uh, kind of going back to the conservative Christians and the conservative religious movement, uh, that concern of like, oh, this is the devil's music and it's only going to corrupt our our kids and, and lead to moral disrepair and, and uh, the whole of society is going to collapse because of this music. Um, so I felt like that was kind of a, a, a throw or nod to that that whole panic from the 60s as well. Plus, we've got to appreciate the, the foreshadowing of the Star Spangled Banner here. Mm -hmm. with yeah. The, to Anacreon in heaven. I tried to figure out if there was anything deeper to that, but I couldn't. Just seems to be a nice little reference. The way that I kind of took it, if you're someone who, who knows kind of the lineage there musically, is just this idea that it's not it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that america tried to separate off from from england and that you know just sort of a a kind of signpost that that was sort of already in the air sort of already brewing at this point um even if it's not what we know as the star spangled banner quite yet uh and we so we get an, a couple more um parallels with against the day again um yeah, and and this is one of those things where I kind of constantly feel bad bringing it up, but I think it's it's a important thing to bring up the connection between this book and and Against the Day. Um, not just you know obviously we've we've I think talked about it so much now the the thematic parallels that that run throughout this. Um, the ley lines come up again in these chapters, um, specifically the use of uh, electricity and and conducting electricity across the the stones. I think it was. Towards the end of, I think it was the end of the last chapter, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but that also kind of got me thinking, and again, connecting to Against the Day, because he appears in that book. But I, if I'm not mistaken, I think Tesla had an idea of transmitting electric, uh, transmitting electricity wirelessly. Uh, but I think his plan was to do it somehow in, through the atmosphere. I didn't really get a chance to look too far into it, but I remember that being a thing that he was working on. Uh, one of his, I, I don't want to call it far-fetched ideas because he, uh, a lot of the, th the stuff he came up with and, and was right about was far-fetched at the time. Um, but I thought that was an interesting, uh, an interesting kind of connection, but you know, to ground that idea and, and have it be run through these, these stones. Definitely. I think we, I think we'll have a lot more to talk about in the, in that way later on in the book. Yeah, but then the other, so and I, I'm jumping forward a little bit here, but uh, just to kind of keep on the uh, connection to Against the Day, uh, there is a line on page 287 um, where Franklin mentions, he says, I see our greatest problem is time, never anything but time. Um, and it, so that, that got me wondering, just thinking about the importance that time plays in both this and Against the Day um, and, and how that theme and that concept became so important in those two books. Um, and I can't help but think that part of that must have been kind of derived from the amount of time it took him to write both of these books. Um, and so I think it's a really interesting way of, of kind of contemplating on how, as, as time passes, like how do we make our, our mark? You know, Mason and Dixon obviously had their, their physical mark on the earth. Uh, Pinchon has made his mark. Um, you know, as a, as a writer. Um, but I think that's kind of one of those things that we all grapple with as we age and, and as time moves on is, is what, what is it, that's, what is it going to be that defines us as, as a person? Does it need to be something that transcends time, you know, that is, is going to be remembered forever? Or does it, you know, can we make these small impacts, you know, along the way? And um, I, I think that pinch on becoming a father, um, probably, you know, had him ruminating on that as well. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I thought that was a just the more I, I come across these mentions of time and the importance of time and fighting against time, uh, it always kind of, you know, puts me in mind of, of his writing process and his thought process as he was writing this and, and, you know, working to put out these two huge books that are just full of, uh, important historical events and how time has changed not just the people involved in them but the perception of those historical events as well i promise i have thoughts in response to that they are not coming to me <laughs> all right but the, the, no I, I i agree with you i think you're you're get you're onto something very very important to the book um but we'll we'll move on i think 
the one thing I've really been anxious to talk to you to y'all about with these these chapters is the the George Washington scene. <laughs> um, so let's let's go ahead and dive into that because this is, I think for me it was as funny and as bizarre as um, both the the teenage werewolf from earlier um, and you know, some of the other little interesting. Uh, scenes with certain people um but I'm, I'm curious you know how how you all came away with from those scenes or from this scene rather yeah kind of how i had talked about it a bit in the beginning it, it, the fact that pinchon takes you know real elements of of george washington's life like the fact that he did farm hemp and the fact that he did want to see its production and usage in america grow um you know in both in popularity and as a, a piece of commerce is is one thing the fact that he did own slaves is certainly another thing so the the mm -hmm. fact that he he takes these real elements and then sort of turns the dial up to 11 so to speak on the absurdity of it like george washington didn't just grow hemp he was also a pothead and his wife brought him just a silver tray, you know, piled up with all sorts of probably very delicately made pastries that would have taken her hours just for him to eat them while he gets the munchies. Like, he doesn't just own slaves. He has slaves that also are Jewish, and he speaks in a sort of almost ebonics dialect to his slaves like there's so many absurd elements that are potentially you know based in reality not so much the idea that that george washington would have had you know black jewish slaves but th this idea that you know there probably was still even some degree of of, a, of an attempt to enmesh the way that that you speak as as their their master to them in in the development of english language that they were undergoing at the time like and that even of itself recalls slang and people you know code switching to to modern day as as a thing going on so there's so many elements of the scene that are both real history references to modern history and also Pinchonium absurdity that it, it it's the reason why I said that this section stands out as the most Pinchon thing we've read so far. Um and it's incredibly entertaining. At a certain point with how long the scene goes on, you kind of just have to let go of any expectations and allow whatever is gonna happen next to happen next, because yeah. I think it was somewhere around the time that his the, I forgot the name of the the slave character who comes and talks to them, but is around the time that he bent over to show that he was wearing a kippa that I was just like, okay, I don't remember this the first time I read the book, but I'm just going to allow this to just go in whatever direction it's going to yeah. go now. And, you know, you just kind of have to surrender to that scene somewhat um, and, and just let Pinchon guide you through that. Because at the end of the day, they're even still talking about, you know, they're they're still talking about real elements of American history with with commerce and the drawing of the Mason and Dixon line while they're there, but it's all cloaked in this absolute absurdity. Um and and all of the characters in the scene are also high. So there's a possible the possibility that that has affected how they either told it to Cherry Coke later on, or Cherry Coke's making all of this up, which could explain yeah. why it's so absurd. It, it's it is truly a crazy scene. <laughs> It it really is, and it was one that because you know, as I've mentioned, this is the this is the second time I've read this book, uh, and I I think I just totally forgot that this scene was in here. And going Same. through it, I was just you know I, I it starts happening, and I'm like, okay, I, I see where this is going. Like it's it's becoming that kind of you know um, stoner comedy moment where you know we're kind of getting in this Cheech and Chong thing. But then Washington starts you know like you mentioned the he changes the way he speaks and then i'm like okay now we're this is like the scene in airplane where the old woman speaks jive yep and it's and then washington's you know martha washington brings in these gingerbread cookies that 
George Washington is very carefully inspecting to make sure that they like meet his quality standards before he can actually eat them. And then he just doesn't fucking care anymore. He just goes ahead and eats them anyway. It, it was just, I ended up like putting the book down after that scene and just like, mm-hmm. I need a minute to just kind of <laughs> absorb what's just happened. I feel like I almost got a contact high from just reading it. Yeah, there, there's almost a sec- an element of it that reminds me of Eric Andre's humor. Not yeah, yeah. Not not to like the disgusting side of Eric Andre's humor, like where he does a lot of gross out stuff, but more to the the absurdity of some of his humor, especially like his stand up comedy. Um, like, it kind of has the same vibe as his um, cat burglar bit, where he climbs yeah. into restaurants and just <laughs> yeah. steals yeah. things in front of people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know why, it's just that particular tone of humor, I think, fits. Mm-hmm. But, um, I, I act, so, first of all, I think it's ridiculous, Cody, that you, you forgot this scene existed. Because I don't know how I forgot it, because it's, so, it's memorable. Yeah, yeah but, so this was my first Pinchin book, and between the s- scene of Ben Franklin saying, Oh, there are so many pains that nothing can fix, even if some can be healed with Ben's balm. Between that and then this insane, like, vaudeville act that he has with his house slave, it's, I mean, I I just couldn't stop laughing. But I do want to bring bring it down a little bit and talk about the fact that Gershom, the, the house slave, is only ever mm-hmm. referred to as a manservant. And the only time that there's ever a discussion of the actual power dynamics is when George Washington specifically mentions... Oh, well, yes, and he's made some tidy investments, and he, he's coming up on a net worth rivaling his own supposed master. And it really, it, it evokes to me a lot of the, the sanitization of the Founding Fathers that uh, American schooling and culture has done in the past hundred years, yeah. especially. Mm-hmm. Especially the, the, the focus on, oh, George Washington freed his slaves after he died. Little things like that, and not necessarily in just the satirical sense, but also in the sense that, yeah, if you're going to have somebody who thinks of themselves as a champion of the downtrodden, like George Washington definitely did to some extent, um, he probably did have this very strange relationship with his slaves, where he did think of them in in a double-think Orwellian kind of manner of, well, these are my genuine friends, I do genuinely like them, but they are also so genuinely my property. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it's a, it's, it's a good point. Cause that is, you know, and I, I don't know how, um, how keyed into something like that. People who are reading this book that aren't in America would be, you know, not having gone through the American education system and, um, and not just having gone through it, but having gone through it and then coming out the other side and, and learning all the things that, we were taught or not taught um and how different a lot of that can be um and i think that ties into the 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 kind of thematic element of of how history is written and who writes history um and so you know it's it is a really good point um and so i'm glad you i'm glad you brought that up and i do in particular i think the there's a moment where george washington says um that Ger- Gershom's japes and jokes are making me just me sugar. And uh, it's curious that he's not just adap- adopting, you know, colloquially used language amongst the, 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 the black people in Virginia at the time, but he is also, he's adopting Jewish slang from his right hand slave. Yup. Yeah. Like he he is he is taking every aspect of Gershom's personhood as himself, with the exception of claiming that oh I'm just his supposed master. Mm-hmm. Well, it makes me wonder how uh, how Gershom sees his relationship with Washington because you know later on at, at kind of at the end of of their um, little smokeout section. Uh, when when the discussion of the the plates comes up, it it becomes kind of apparent that Gershom isn't he doesn't buy into the the kind of level of belief that Washington has for those plates um, because he specifically mislabels them. He calls them dead weights, and then uh, what did I say? Lead plates. Um, 
so it makes me wonder, like, because Washington, you know, he is putting on this this air of like, oh, this is my friend, and and you know, we're all chummy and buddy buddy. But you know, like you mentioned, well, like he's basically there's this level of like cultural appropriation that's happening right in front of his face, which I have to imagine Gershom, you know, would take umbrage at. Um, yeah, and but it can't really do anything about it because of his position in in society. So it, it you know, I'm I'm curious how Gershom as a character would have reacted, you know, internally, but we don't really get a lot of that, you know, in this scene. Yeah, and the, the closest thing that we have in, in popular culture to Gershom is weirdly actually um, Samuel L. Jackson in I, yep. uh, Django Unchained. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was who I was going to mention too. <laughs> yeah, we we have plenty of uh, what what has now become termed the Uncle Tom in fiction, but it... it we we don't see very many like direct like house slaves who are chummy with their masters in in media, and it's because it is a sickening subject. It is yeah. genuinely oh, yeah. disgusting to think about. Um, so because it it is, you know, you you sit back and you can try to judge those those people, um, but also they are victims, but they are also, you know, the least victimized. So you, you just kind of, especially for Americans, it's just kind of um, looping, just looping, looping generational trauma. Yeah, absolutely. Which, I mean, if we're going to look at different aspects of these chapters as breaking down, you know, cultural cycles, like we were just talking about with, with the 60s and religion and music, this would be another case of, of like you're saying, well, cultural cycles of trauma uh, still still taking place. because. You know, at, at the end of the day, we still talk about cultural appropriation. We still talk about the fact that there are plenty of people, uh, you know, who who code switch when they talk with people of color and who who pretend to uh, to be a part of that same culture and have an investment in that culture when in actuality they don't. Um, that is another case where where these these cycles of history bear out is true you know over the the centuries well and, and i think a lot of this is kind of foreshadowed at, at the beginning of, of chapter 28 in in the quote from uh cherry coke's spiritual day book it it kind of has this setup of you know talking about the how i don't i don't i don't know if the if if he's trying if pinchon is trying to point at this as a um uniquely american thing it kind of seems to be uh especially nowadays but this idea of this, this cultural appropriation that exists uh not just in in the scene but you know as we have seen so often but he talks about in this opening section about how the these slave owners will you know copy the dance steps that their their slaves have taught them and they kind of take upon themselves this this uh presentation of like you know like we've been talking about this whole like oh yeah we're we're all friends and and you know it's all you know business and and you know trying to uh rationalize this awful thing that they're doing um in in any way that they possibly can and it's it really i don't you know i i should probably dive more into, the, into it historically but i don't know if if that was the same in other countries where slavery was practiced at the time mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's that's a good question, because internally in this book, the only other instances that we have of the slave trade being present or, you know, being a part of one of the colonies that Mason or Dixon have gone to, it's just overtly cruel. There's no, there's no seemingly, I don't want to use the word positive, but seemingly like chummy coding to it that some people are, who own slaves are trying to, to apply to to what they're doing it's just overtly wrong and and it, it's delivered in such a way that can give the reader no other recourse you know going back to the 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 black hole of calcutta or the breeding projects that we saw in helena and, and in cape town um you know so within within the realm of the book certainly this is the only place where we've seen that happen so far and you know i i Confess similar to yourself, I, I haven't read much about the slave trade in other countries, so I don't I don't know um whether or not that was the case when it was still legal in other countries, but I do know that it 
it lasted longer in America than anywhere else. We were one of the last places yeah. to abolish slavery. And there has persisted this unique idea amongst people who want to either downplay the importance of the Civil War or to, for whatever reason, whitewash some of the history of slavery in the United States where they try to say, well, not everyone was bad to their slaves. Not every master was... Yeah. Was, was was violent or evil that that concept feels uniquely american i don't hear of anybody from any other country when discussing the history of slave of the slave trade in that country bring that up that seems to be very yeah. uniquely american and i think that the absurdity of this section you know the, the fact that pinchon does bring the inherent you know, both tragedy and comedy of this scene to Eleven in the way that he does, I think really does illustrate to the reader, if they're, again, doing a close reading of the book, how impossible that idea is. Because even when you have this person who's not referred to as a slave, to Will's point, you know, is given this different title that he's only referred to by, seems to have a sort of chummy relationship with with george washington or at least not an hourly contentious one there is still i think no way that you can come away from the scene not cringing at what george washington is doing by mm -hmm. adopting these aesthetic ways of speaking or comporting himself to somehow act similar to his manservant um you, you still come away from this scene thinking to yourself that that was that was pretty gross what you just did and even though there's yeah. there's an inherent humor to it you know i i think the way that he illuminates that is is another another example of his brilliance as a writer like we've been talking about this whole episode yeah and it's you know it, it's i think it's important for thing for for this you know discussion of uh of american history and especially this time in american history to to Put a spotlight on on the cruelty that was existing at the time and the attempts at the same time to uh you know kind of sweep it under the rug and make it appear as as not a thing and so it's i i think honestly like given the time that this book came out to do that it was kind of a bold move because we were still in a time culturally where we were still allowing for a lot of the racist and stereotypical imagery uh that existed in media to be presented and and just kind of like it was you know it was a different time that's just how things were okay. and 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 you know brush it away as that and i think we're seeing more and more now you know however you know 20 years down the road um from this book being published um you were finally starting to see a lot of uh some of these companies you know i know i think disney not too long ago when they re-released some of their stuff uh had a disclaimer at the beginning of of one of the videos saying um we're not taking out the the racist you know depictions of of certain people because doing that is as bad as the depiction itself exactly. we're allowing to dismiss that idea and try to pretend it never happened which is you we can't do that and i i had to actually kind of you know appreciate a major company doing something like that because um i think so often we we have tried to just pretend it didn't happen and that's not the right way to approach that kind of thing i think we have to look at it face on and we have to say yeah that was really bad and it shouldn't have happened and we have to make sure it doesn't happen again and to dismiss it as not happening is is just allowing it to happen again so i just i'm sorry i have to i'm very offended right now I cannot believe that you just gave Disney positive credit for something. I uh, yeah. When it, was, when it was actually I, Warner's brothers, Warner brothers. Was it Warner? Okay, yeah, I take it, it back. Disney's games. still terrible. Disney can can die in a hole. Yeah. Let's, yes. Yes. Let's not change the history on that. Credit where credits due. I apologize. Thank you for correcting me on that. So. <laughs> I mean, I, I, last episode of the episode before, I had mentioned that I was watching Mad Men, and there's an episode of Mad Men where Roger. Uh, performs a song in blackface and uh i had forgotten that that was just sort of blatantly in there from when it had first aired so when the episode came up this time around as i'm watching it again 
uh, there was a disclaimer at the beginning of the episode, similar to what you're talking about, where this this specific statement was, in its reliance on historical authenticity, the series producers are committed to exposing the injustices and inequities within our society that continue to this day, so we can examine even the most painful parts of our history in order to reflect on who we are today and who we want to become. We are therefore presenting the original episode in its entirety. And that was something that was added um, to like streaming services that had the show two years mm. ago. Um, and the episode originally aired probably in like 2012 or something like that. So to your point, we're only just now getting around to mentioning these things and, and talking about them openly in entertainment media in general, whether it's Warner Brothers from something significantly much older or a show that is far more contemporary to, to this show and our discussion, certainly. Um, where, yeah, that that would have been a pretty bold move for Pinchon to do in his book because, you know, a lot of our discussion around the fact that the Founding Fathers owned slaves was either they didn't own slaves, like we're just not going to talk about that, or mm -hmm. we kind of assume that because they're the Founding Fathers and they're the, these excellent members of our country's history that they must have treated their slaves properly or were nicely compared to everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to, I, to disagree with you both a little bit, I do, um, I'm not sure that it's, it's, we're necessarily supposed to interpret, uh, Washington's, uh, code switching and borrowing of terms as an intentional, uh, a, a cognizant act. I think it, it, I think in some ways it might be more resonant to consider the fact that he is sincerely engaging with these people as people on a psychological level. It's just that it's the, it's the non-psychological, it's the, the power dynamics that undermine the, the, the authenticity of that. Because if you have like Jewish friends and you, you start picking up Meshuggah, they're not going to be offended by it. It's not an offensive thing to borrow terms. But it really is this misapprehension on his part of what his actual position is, and perhaps the the, the misapprehension is mutual in the context of Gershom. So, I mean, that's a fair point. That is a fair point. Um. Well, and to keep on, but we'll we'll keep on the the downer train for for just another minute here. I did want to bring up and because I, I wanted to get brett's opinion or not opinion i wanted to get his knowledge on this uh, specific um part of history the the general bouquet's proclamation i looked into it a little bit um and i'm sure brett has a lot that he can add to it so brett please um fill in all the the, the gaps that i leave here because there's probably going to be a lot uh but basically my understanding the the proclamation itself um had to do with him uh, with the general trying to uh, get uh, white captives that were, had been taken by native tribes. Um, there was some kind of arrangement that was made to return them, which was met with uh, kind of disdain from the, the natives as they had kind of um, brought those people into their, into their lives and had, they'd been there for a while. So they kind of integrated with them a little bit. What I didn't realize, the connection I didn't make was that General Bouquet was the same general who ordered the distribution of the smallpox infected blankets um, that were distributed to the Native Americans. Um, I don't recall that being mentioned anywhere in the the chapter, but in, in looking into what that proclamation was about, I, I found out that he was the same person who did that. So uh, that was an interesting little connection of history I did know and his, history I didn't know. Um, but uh, piggybacking on that, there's a section that deals with, um, uh, right after the, the proclamation is mentioned, um, I, I thought there was a really interesting discussion that took place there um, regarding uh, ostensibly capitalism and, and westward expansion and eminent domain, where you fi we find out that uh, Bouquet was essentially making money under the, the guise of doing something good. Um, but his, it, you know, obviously his intention was to make a, a whole bunch of money, no matter what the consequence was for the people that ended up suffering, which, you know, I, I think is a major problem with, especially late, late stage capitalism, where, and Pinchon has gone, uh, you know, talked about this in, in most of his work, 
where the 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 profitability of of something is way more important than any human element or environmental element may be concerned it's more about like how can i make money uh, and how much money can i make but dixon has this uh, when it comes to the 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 idea of expanding westward moving american settlers settlers westward um dixon responds with saying why else refrain from expanding west mildly inquires dixon but out of a regard for the humanity of those whose homes they invade and i i absolutely love that response and i think that it really exemplifies dixon's character and and how he views the world uh in in just what is essentially a sentence yeah and immediately following that we have a a wonderful illustration of the kinds of flawed thinking that lead to lead to both you know the, the genocide of native americans as well as slavery in the form of washington moaning all the horrible displacement that ulster scots have experienced a, a population of people who um uh, you know with a real historical perspective in like it, it is it is you know, and I'm not saying anything to anyone with of Ulster descent at all. I, I I think my family's from that bloodline, but um, it, 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 fundamentally, they are not the people who deserve the most sympathy in 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 mm. the context of people settling the Alleghenies, and yet it's all that Washington cares about. So. Chapter 29, um, I really like the opening here. Um, I, I, I kind of really appreciate the, as someone who I, I've grown up in, I don't want to say I, I grew up in a rural environment, but I, I grew up um, with a, a, a dad who was really into hunting and fishing. So I grew up around a lot of that. So um, either this, this opening scene where the people in the town are kind of witnessing the, the slaughters uh, of of different animals and and not really not really ready for what what the reality of that is um I, that kind of clicked with me a little bit because I, i've seen people who have you know if you haven't been exposed to that uh that kind of thing it can really be jarring um especially when you're just used to like oh there's some meat i'll buy it and i'll cook it and i'll eat it but when you actually see the the process of of taking that off of an animal it can really be um a jarring experience but I did want to. I want to talk about the uh, the the wax museum that they visit. Mm-hmm. Um, I really. So the the first thing I wrote in my notes was that I, I really appreciate the level of detail um, that was done for the the beheading models. You know where I think so many other. Um, I, if there were other competing businesses that were making those would have cut corners and just made these kind of cheap things, but they're going to the, the, the length of, you know, obtaining uh, bones and, and other things that would mimic bones to give an authentic experience. Um, something like that I felt was a really kind of a very Pinchonian thing to put in there that, you know, I, I almost felt like it was a little bit of a self nod, you know, of this, you know, attention to detail and how important that can be um, was a little, a nice little thing to have in there. I thought that was an, a little interesting flourish or touch. Yeah, I think it's also, you know, interesting that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there's been no specific mention of, you know, purveyors of, of business or, or wares of any kind in the other places that people have gone going to such lengths or such detail, which when we open these sections with showing the competitiveness of business, all of these different, you know, people who are sort of acting like carnival barkers for the stuff that they're trying to hawk on the boardwalks and at the docks, you know, it isn't difficult to imagine that you would need to find some sort of way to differentiate yourself from everybody else trying to make a buck. And that you have these businesses going to such a length, like you're talking about, of, of, you know, acquiring actual bones and and putting all of this work into it as a way of, of separating themselves out from the rest of, of the people who might do something similar feels relevant to the, the commerce of the area that they're in at the moment. Yeah. And then I, I love the, the whole scene where, um, where we go, we get to go into the, the back back room as it were, um, is, you know, it, it, 
it was a very evocative scene for me. Um, it, I, I really loved the way that that he wrote that whole um, that whole scene. Like just from from walking into that room and and seeing all the faces and just the the atmosphere that is is brought into that whole scene. It it was a little bit of a tonal shift from you know going from that opening scene of the. Uh, the townspeople watching the butchers and, and learning about how the wax figures are made and then going into this dark room, you know, just I, I was thinking about how I would react in that kind of situation of walking in this dark room full of these wax figures. Um, and I, I, I wouldn't terrifying. handle it well. Yeah, I definitely yeah. would not handle it well. Especially coming from like being forcibly initiated into a secret society. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine being just at a at a tavern just hanging out and having all these people I guess try to scam drinks out of me and then just walk into a back room where there are dozens of what seem to be people just staring. Right. It is. It's very Twilight Zone esque in the episode where the mannequins turn into real people at night. Yeah. Like, oh, is that, is that what's going to happen to me after they, they steal all these drinks from me too? I'm going to get turned into a wax figure? Yeah. And it's, yeah, I think, yeah, it does work especially well after that because the Masons, you know, especially at, at this point in history, not history in the book, but our the time in which this book was published, like the, the Masonic temple had taken on such an air of mystique and, and, um, yeah. you know, cultural horror almost. Um, and, and kind of rightly so there is a lot of intentional, um, uh, you know, air of, of not letting people in and, and only providing little bits of information to, to people who aren't in on, on everything that they do. So it kind of lends itself already to, you know, this, this mysterious element. And then you have, you know, walking in after probably a couple of drinks, walking into a room where there's, you know, this circle of dead eyed faces staring at you. Mm -hmm. Let's mention too, the fact that we have like all of the shadowy stuff around an actual religious institution being the Jesuits, not only mm -hmm. le leading up to the arrival in America, but also this kind of fear that, like Benjamin Franklin has about it, and this belief that they may have some methodology of instantaneous communication. Like there's, there's very shadowy elements that we've already experienced from a religious aspect of of something, but now we're getting it from a a non-religious aspect of something. Like the, the, the frightening sort of shadowy. I don't exactly know what the point of this is, or or why it's being secreted away. Is is present, no matter what type of society you're choosing to join or align yourself with. Yeah, and it's it's especially poignant that, you know, they get to these back rooms or these secret societies, and it just, all they can think is, wow, this is just a normal bar. Yeah. No, nothing is happening <laughs> except, like, some games of poker. Right. It really, like, from every, everything I understand about modern masonic temples and similar societies is that that's kind of how it is is it you just kind of walk in and it's it's like walking into a legion bar or something mm -hmm. it it is i can say from experience it is um so i hey i don't, I don't want to get you know do too much personal stuff uh, on here but i did actually get invited to a masonic um uh i guess Lodge. I don't want to call it a pageant, but a lodge. Yeah, like when I was in, uh, I think I was in sixth grade. Uh, myself oh. and, and a friend of mine got invited to to be uh, part members of this of this temple, and my my dad was making a big deal about it, and you're like, oh, this is a a once in a lifetime thing. And it, I had read a little bit about it um, in, in in an encyclopedia that I found at my school library, and it I, I got that you know air of mystique about the whole thing, and so I in my mind. Uh, I had built it up to be this weird thing. And then the Simpsons episode had just come out um, where Homer joined the, the Stonecutters, which was ostensibly the Masons. <laughs> um, so that was informing my whole view of it. And I, I walk in and it was just, it was weird in it, in its own way, but it wasn't weird in the way that it's presented. Um, I went to two of the, the meetings and I just was like, I can't, this is weird. Um, I was already at the time really kind of questioning religion anyways. And so I, I didn't really want anything to do with it, but it it is it it is weird in its normalcy. I think is the best way to describe it. Yeah, it's yeah. it's almost. I mean, there. I knew a Freemason. He was a he was a regular employee or not employee customer at one of these places that I worked, and he was just 
like a normal guy and I had seen his ring that he wore a couple of times and just asked him like, what do you guys do? And for, for the most part, he just said, Oh, we just, you just get together just talk about life with one another. And yeah. Kind of, kind of just, it, it's sort of a fraternity and it, it, there's almost something stranger about a group of people, uh, dressing up in like similar coordinated outfits with rankings and having like non-religious rituals for the purpose of just a fraternity there's something almost weirder about that than if you were an actual cult (laughs) where it's like can't we all just like hang out together and just you know like a vfw just get drinks based on the fact that we all kind of know each other as opposed to like why did why do we have to like have these weird these weird rituals why is dave wearing that weird hat yeah, yeah, why are we wearing smocks? <laughs> uh, it kind of reminds me of the air conditioning repair school and community. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then and all of this all of this weirdness and and tension builds up to Ben Franklin's little pageant mm-hmm. essentially. And and I loved that scene too. Um it, it just the yeah, this is this is that kind of example that you were talking about at the beginning of the episode, Kate, where you we have these historical figures who are, you know, they're 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 in the right place historically, um, but they're being kind of put into these bizarre situations that probably, you know, in some cases probably wouldn't have happened. You know, like Washington getting stoned uh and and having the munchies and all that could have happened, you know, more than likely did it happen? I don't know. But Benjamin Franklin's light show, um, you know, is so just out there and, and hilariously fun um, yeah. that it, it it's another one of those, you know, it, it's another one of those moments in these chapters that is that makes it so Pinchonian. Yeah, absolutely. And we were talking before the show started about how I'd been listening to a lot of Patti Smith and she has an aside on one of her records where she's just doing stage banter. It's a concert in mm. D.C., so she brings up George Washington, and she says, this is a man who was our first president. He was the general of our army. He died with syphilis, with wooden teeth, and had a field of marijuana plants. That guy had to have partied. So yeah. I I personally choose to believe that he probably was was smoking some of his plants. Um, oh, yeah. I think so. But I, 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 I don't think that... There will ever be definitive proof of that. I, I doubt that uh, he he decided to do any writing while he was high and and confessed what yeah. he was doing in said letters. <laughs> well, and, and I I find the the dance macabre thing kind of uh, reminiscent of the brain. What is the word? Bunch of people, new age, trying to talk to dead people. Seance. Oh, seance. Yeah, yeah. Um, the seance mm-hmm. scenes in Gravity's Rainbow. Um, the the oh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's I'm not I'm not entirely sure why. I think it just comes down to the the juxtaposition of modern and archaic. Um, the, yeah. The, the the whole dance macabre thing was basically a trend in the the 18th century where people were realizing, well, if you pass electricity through muscles, they twitch. You know, gal. Galvano with his, or Galvani with his frog legs and all that. And so it, to, to me, this reads as some kind of spiritual pursuit. And I can't parse what it's trying to be, but it feels mm-hmm. like it is. I, I think the other thing that I picked up on that section in particular with, with the Dance Macabre is that kind of like we were talking about with the Masons being this like pseudo religious order that has no religion. You know, and and how that's coming up all over this chapter. You kind of have a melding of these these pseudo religious groups with modern science, which gets to the stuff that Pinchon is writing about in this book about the development of you know scientific method and and kind of the slow unwinding of religion as a popularity uh, or as a, as a popular thing for someone to identify them as, and instead kind of this tension between science and religion that's cropping up. You have like something that to your point will is rooted in you know different forms of paganism and different forms of spiritualistic practice mixed with this guy who famously you know 
harnessed electricity using a key on a kite and he's he's directing people outside to go and and catch lightning bolts so to speak using using probably different scientific methods that he he was really developing at the time like there's something in this um scene that to me speaks to kind of that tension between between religion or spirituality and and science in that you have somebody who is famously a deist uh but also a a important scientist to the the early american colonies sort of engaging in something that is both religious and non-religious and is is kind of shepherding people along with him which is something that we would normally only recognize as being a religious activity it yeah it had to me it it had the kind of presentation and pageantry of a uh, a magic show and it felt to me kind of like Franklin using that the the theatrics of a of a magician's performance to you know expound on and and show the the true wonder of of something scientific um and you know it's I, I think the imagery that was sticking with me for some reason was was the the uh show at, in the prestige um mm. that well, you 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 know is utilizing all the electricity and and flashing it back and forth across the stage, but I kind of got the idea that Franklin was doing that more so in a way to say like, hey, look how cool this actual thing is. Like, we can use this, and it's really there's a lot of potential in it. So you know, what better way to get that message out than than to create this kind of flashy presentation and and present it as this miraculous, um, otherworldly or or almost like pseudo religious experience. Well, the, the thing that I think the thing that takes it from that that general kind of showmanship angle to a more sinister one for me is the last paragraph where he says, "So much for Harlequin," cries Doctor Franklin. Let us get out into the night's main drama. There's red, there's weather gear for all. This scythe here is the perfect shape to catch us a bolt, perhaps a good many, better than a key upon a kite. Indeed, think of it as death's lock pick or pick lock. Come, form your line, all there, or all here. Felonious entry into the anterooms of the Creator. So he's clearly at least trying to sell it as a spiritual experience to be mm -hmm. struck by lightning. And there, there's something about the way that, you know, he's the guy who got struck with the, the key on the kite. So what did he see that is making him do all of this? Yeah. What, did, what yeah. did he, what behind the veil is urging this strange man? Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. The last thing that I wanted to bring up um, was the, the closing lines of, the, of chapter 30. Um, it, it, we've talked about before how it, there's this, this element of predestination or fate um, and that, that Mason and Dixon are kind of on this preset path uh, to accomplish this goal for their you know, the people who can benefit from it financially. And I think that's kind of uh, summarized in, in the last uh, paragraph uh, in the chapter um, where it says, they imagine that you and your instrument will make of them nabobs like Lord Lepton to whose ill reputed plantation you must be drawn upon your West relentlessly as the needle. Then sailor among the iron isles, uh, circumferential swab beware. Uh, I, I kind of took that as, you know, they're, they're set on this path that they, don't really have much say in and it's you know their their ultimate goal was to benefit the the east india company um who we saw earlier and i meant to bring this up uh when when they were talking to franklin uh the eic definitely seemed to have some complicity in in what happened to them with the attack by the french ship um it if i remember correctly franklin was kind of implying like yeah they knew that you were going to run into them and they just, you know, didn't really bother to say anything about it or tip you off about it or anything like that. It was just, you know, a thing for them. And, you know, I wasn't there, but this is what I heard kind of thing. Hi, huh, I must've missed that. If you could dig that up, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. Let me hold on just a second. Let me go back. It's on page 270. Um, when they're talking to, it's the paragraph that starts with uh, flow just on an electric fire. Um, but then a little further into that, uh, he says, they knew the French had uh, been cool and would be as content to seek the seahorse there as off breast. They all knew, but they could never allow upstarts to advise them in the matters of global strategy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The Royal Society. Yeah. I'm sorry. Royal. Yeah. I'm sorry. I okay. I, I, 
I mixed up there. Um, but did y'all have anything else that you wanted to bring up plot wise before we move on to the uh, the humorous bits? No, I think we've covered everything here pretty well. Well, I guess I guess the only thing I can the, the question I suppose I have is who is it that's speaking of Pennsylvania pop? politics prior to the dance macabre in chapter 29 that is a good question because it does seem intentionally left vague yeah yeah and so is is it supposed to be franklin i don't think so because it says he's he appears i don't know he's curious it, it, it's it, it's some sort of like narrator speaking to mason or something i kind of, i guess i took it at the time i was reading it as because it's Mason when he goes to the, the Orchid Tavern. I guess I, I took it, I guess, at the time as just being someone, some random person there that he was talking to. Because I don't recall there being a specific mention of who he was talking to. Yeah, that's I, I took it as being um, Franklin my first time reading the book. And this, this time through, I, 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 get, I just assumed it was some random person at the bar. Yeah, but... Because he, I mean, he replies to him, like, the first part of page 294, he says, uh, it says, not sure I'm following this, Mason says. So he's clearly having a conversation with someone, but uh, yeah, I can't see where it's, it, it's explicitly stated who he's talking to. Well, if any listeners know, I would, I would love to know. Um, that's, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't have an answer to that question. Yeah. Anywho. Yeah. I think it's time for humor then. Yes, yes, yes. Um. So I'll, I'll, I'll start. I, I loved, th there was a scene on page 269 where Mason, not Mason, I'm sorry, Dixon, uh, seems to have like bought a back alley watch. Um, <laughs> from, yeah. There's just that whole thing of like, do you know a lad named Lewis? He said he knew you, Dr. Franklin. Uh, where was this? Franklin has begun twirling his hair upon either side of his head into long curls. Just out in the alley, he tried to sell me a watch. Said it was a Masonic astrologer's model, sign of the Zodiac, phases of the moon. You didn't couldn't not unless one of you wants to lend me i'll go have a look mason rising come on dixon and point him out and then dixon's just like no don't, eh, we don't need to worry about it it's fine yeah and then the fact that once uh i think it's i think it's dixon who leaves second or they they both encounter this person um yeah out in the street and there was like it's so hard to tell whether or not this is something that they're using to mess with ben franklin or if Franklin has paid for someone to distract them outside the tavern so that he can interrogate the other by trying to sell them a watch. Like it's it's yeah, it's it's another one of these very pinch on moments of of humor and absurdity that it's it's hard to understand who is doing what to who else in this in this scene. Um but it, it did definitely uh make me laugh pretty hard amongst a lot of scenes that make me laugh pretty hard in this section of the book. Yeah, I, I definitely interpreted it as someone Franklin had hired to, yeah. to distract them. Glad I'm not alone in that. That was definitely what I was thinking too, because he would have needed time in order to uh, in order to, to interrogate them the way that he did. But then the fact that they almost understand what he's doing and are just... <laughs> trying to to play up the absurdity of it back to him i really enjoyed yeah and I, you know basically the next page a couple pages on i just really enjoy the the section where washington just makes the joke of hey we could just stand in a shed as though that's like an insightful thing to point out about people <laughs> it's just it's one of those jokes that's funny because it's being made yeah um i also liked i i I don't know what about it appealed to me so much and or just made me chuckle. Um, but on page 297, when uh, Dixon sees Clovis, he's described as spread out like a spider among the radial rafters watching him. Um, just that imagery of this guy, like essentially like it's one of those like movie scenes, you know, where the person's like prop themselves up in a, in a roof or a ceiling and is kind of watching and, and, trying not to be seen but then they get seen and it becomes that awkward exchange of like oh hey how, how's it going <laughs> and then i guess do we have quotes if anybody wants to i know will's gonna go last because we have to one of us has to try and steal his thunder yeah this yes, is established tradition at this point this is yeah 
Uh, my my quote, um, we talked about it at length in the beginning of the episode, but I'll actually read out some of it. My quote would be when they arrive in Philadelphia uh, in the way that, that, that Pinchon kind of characterizes what the docks are like and, and sort of the the place that they've that they've come into um children at that time philadelphia was second only to london as the greatest of english-speaking cities the ship's landing ran well up into the town by way of dock creek so that the final approach was like being reached out to the wind baffled a slow embrace of brickwork as the town came to swallow one by one their oceanic degrees of freedom once as many as a compass boxed and now as they single up all lines, as they secure from sea detail, as they come to rest, none. Here is danger's own home port, where mates swallow the anchor and have fatal failures of judgment, where a sailor who goes up an alley may not return the same swab at all. Tis the middle of November, though seeming not much different from a late English summer, it is an overcast evening. Rain in the offing. In a street nearby, oysters from the Delaware shore are being cried by the wagon load, the surveyors stand together at the quarter deck, mason in gray stockings, brown breeches, and snuff colored coat with pinch back buttons. Dixon in red coat, breeches, and boots, and a hat with a severely military rake to it, waiting the instruments both now more keenly than at any time during this late passage, feeling like supercargo, posed not before wild seas or exotic landscapes, but amongst objects of oceanic commerce as all round them sailors and dockmen labor nets lift and sway as if by themselves bulging with casks of nails and jellied eels british biscuit and buttons for your waistcoat tonics colognes golden provolones upon the docks a mighty bustling proceeds as wagon drivers mingle with higher-born couples in italian chases Negroes with hand barrows irish servants with cargo of all sorts upon their backs running dogs rooting hogs and underfoot lies all the debris of global traffic. Shreds of spices and teas and coffee berries, splashes of Geneva gin and Queen of Hungary water, oranges and shaddocks fallen and squashed, seeds that have sprouted between the cobblestones, pills balsamic and universal, ground and scattered down where the flies convene and the spadger hops. That's just two paragraphs of it. He continues on for a little while after that, but... I, I just I love the way that he describes the their arrival, what the city is like, the the sort of uh, different facets of commerce that are immediately present when they arrive. I, I love the inclusion of Mason and Dixon feeling somewhat like super cargo as they're at the front of of the ship being brought into port, like somehow they. While they are cargo because they've been brought here by somebody else, they somehow have some kind of elevated purpose above everything else, which, as we've just kind of talked about, they, they're, they're there to, to elevate the powers that be in this border dispute. Um, it, it's, it's really beautiful, and it continues on for, for another page or so. And there's even like a, like a brief song in there, of course, because it's pinch on. Um, but it's, it, it is really remarkable. And I, I found that in that first paragraph describing kind of how the, the city comes out of the water almost until these different lanes that the ships are traveling in get swallowed up by one by one until they just make con contact with, with uh, the docks. It was very reminiscent of, of twin mountains of Helena appear out of nowhere and it being kind of this terrifying thing. It's, it's, listed as kind of this shining city on a hill almost so he's he's using similar language but to denote something completely different than when he did it earlier in the book well you you stole one of mine so <laughs> i'm not sure if will had that one too but <laughs> that was uh that was one of mine it's beautiful like that yeah you yeah. you hit the nail on the head like it's it is just absolutely stunning and um such a great way to uh to open um this whole section um, I will, uh, go kind of back to the humorous side of things. Um, this one, and I'll preface this by saying this, I, I think this one resonated with me, uh, specifically because of, uh, my dad and my grandfather, uh, who both snore in such a manner. Uh, the, the best way I, I've been able to describe it, there was a, an old Calvin and Hobbes comic where his dad was snoring. And Calvin described it as trucks downshifting on the highway. <laughs> um, 
that that's always stuck with me and i there have been times where i've been on they've been in separate rooms on either side of me and it's the most obnoxious and horrifying thing i can't i'm a very light sleeper and it always keeps me awake and so on page 292 um there's this uh, brief little part it just says uh Upon his own side of the bed, Dixon snores in a versatility of tone that Mason, were he less anxious about getting to sleep, might be taking notes upon, perhaps to be written up and submitted to the philosophical transactions. So unexpectedly polyphonic do, do passages emerge, all at the same unhurried yet presently, in, presently infuriating a Dante. Both men lie in the clothing they have worn all day. Dixon is faithful to field surveyor's custom as Mason to that of the stargazer. His quotidian dress at Greenwich, having ever doubled as his observing suit, to sleep one simply took off the coat, though Dixon has advised against this here. He is, of course, right. The bugs run free, American bugs, who so much resent being brushed off human surfaces that they will bite anyone for even approaching. Um, that, as I mentioned earlier, like, I spent a lot of time as a kid going hunting with my dad and uh, getting bitten by bugs at the same time. So that one, that little bit really kind of reminded me of those times of being in this garbage, either a little camper or a tent, uh, unable to sleep because my dad's snoring so loud that I can't do anything but hear it, uh, and being chewed up by these bugs who seem to have no other purpose in existing other than to uh, just be parasites on me. Yep. Anyone who's been out in the wilderness has experienced that. Yep. I've actually experienced that not in the wilderness. I'm so I mean, lucky. depending on where you live in the country, yeah, that can absolutely just be your day-to-day -day life. That's yeah, fair. I Growing up a, in Chicago. Uh, I spent a week in Alaska with some family in a cabin. And, uh, yeah, the snoring was cacophonous, and the mosquitoes <laughs> were constant. Mm -hmm. All right, so, Will, what do, you, what do you have? What's your... Well, I've, I've evaded being completely stolen from by means of cheating. Ah, ah. Um, <laughs> I, I have just decided to point to the whole first two pages, essentially. So you did steal a bit of mine, Kate. Okay. And so I, I'm sorry for not commenting when you read your section out, but uh, I'll, I'll get to it. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to read essentially the first, the, the, the poem and then the first two paragraphs. Sure. For four score years, the boundary dispute had lain in chancery irresolute as pens and baltimores were born and passed and nothing ever seemed to move too fast though maryland's case be stronger on the merits yet pens the friend at court of certain ferrets who worry every dimly doubtful acre the betting in the clubs is with the quaker let judges judge and lawyers have their day yet soon or late the line will find its way for skies grow thick with aviating swine ere men pass up the chance to draw a line so one day into delaware's great basin with strange machinery sailed mr mason and mr dixon by the falmouth packet connected as with some invisible bracket sharing a fate directed by the stars to mark the earth with geometric scars timothy talks the line from the shore they will hear milkmaids quarreling and cowbells a clank and dogs and babies old and new hammers upon nails wives upon husbands the ring of pot lids the jingling of draft chains a rifle shot from a stretch of woods lengthily crackling tree to tree and across the water an animal will come to a headland and stand regarding them with narrowly set eyes that glow a moment its face slowly turning as they pass america at sunset they raise the capes of Del Delaware and lie for the night in Horkill Road just inside Cape Henlopen. The astronomers hear rails whistling and a feral screaming in the brakes that one imagines as heat and the other as slaughter. Though they do not discuss this, somewhere a channel buoy rings, reports all arrive, night, er, arrive all night of lights upon the shore, sailors prowl the decks losing sleep, the sunrise comes chased beyond all easy wit. This coffee is brewed once, then poured through its own grounds again by Shorty the cook. Among the morning breezes, Captain Falconer works his vessel back out between the hen and chickens and the shears to the main channel, and with a pilot willing to take packet wages aboard, begins threading among the bars and flats of Delaware Bay toward Newcastle, where the bay, narrowed by then to a river, takes its great 90-degree turn eastward, the town wheeling away to Larbor Brick, white, grayish-blue of a precise shade neither astronomer has ever seen, citizens and their children waving, horses a clop upon the paving stones, white public trim work shifting like furniture upon the sky. And that, 
from if you ask me from the start of the the actual poem part through the the section which you read kate all of that could be excerpted as a poem essentially it, it is yeah yeah, I mean the rhythm is so strong and intense, and the in the, the rhyming the inside of the lines and with it, and like the the flipping of words, in inside of themselves, <laughs> is beautiful. Just that entire section, and beyond that, um, a very short story. I once went to visit a friend in Baltimore, and one night it was around. 9 p.m. He said, hey, let's go look for horseshoe crabs in Delaware. And so we drove for four hours to Cape Henlopen. And we made a wrong turn and we ended up exactly at this point, exactly where they would have anchored for the night. Hmm. Um, and I didn't, I had read this book before, but I didn't realize that at the time. I just thought, well, we made a wrong turn. And, uh, we had arrived at Slaughter Beach, and it turns out that there had been a red tide that day. So the entire beach was covered in dead fish. And I'm not sure why it is, because this is not a dark excerpt. The, 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 these opening lines are not sinister or depressing or anything. But something about the way that I came to know Cape Henlopen as this dark, shrouded, forested area where these politicians' vacation homes back up to pe beaches covered in dead fish and this huge military base that I trespassed and wandered through. Um, it, that, that opening description of Cape Henlopen, as brief as it really is, just does fit that perfectly for me. And so for a personal reason, this time, I chose that section. That's a great choice. Yeah, thanks for sure. Um, so what would we say is the most pension part of this? I, I think I, I would say it's the, the Washington uh, encounter. Yeah. Um, can't, can't just in its, in its absurdity and it's, you know, everything that we talked about with it. And I forgot to mention too, I thought the, uh, there was that kind of musical movie moment where they, after they sang their song and, and George and Martha kind of turn and look at each other just had that really like Rogers and Hammerstein um, <laughs> kind of chef's kiss for it, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would have to agree. I, I can't think of anything else that's going to stand out as the most pinch on part of it. I unless we just want to say the entirety of these five chapters. Um, yeah. as, as we've talked about <laughs> numerous times in this episode, the whole thing is really just really kind of encapsulates everything Pinchon does in his in his body of work in, in these five chapters. I I I do think that Franklin is a little bit more Pinchonian. Specifically him, him him saying things like him just pulling out aphorisms like friend Dixon loyalty is a gem of worth the nate <laughs> whose price is never noticed until too late. Where there, I there's forgot a, about his there's no way there's no way that benjamin franklin actually walked around dispensing his aphorisms like that but i but wish it's he a did. better world exactly and that's very pinch on to me is that's the, yeah. the sense of like i wish the world had been like this in a yeah. way that we kind of remember it yeah yeah that's that's a fair point <laughs> thank you for reminding me of that because i had, i had forgotten about his little Rhyming words of wisdom. Uh, well, um, I think that'll, that'll cover uh, chapters 31. Uh, I'm sorry, chapters 26 through 30. Uh, next week, we'll do chapters 31 through 35. Um, and so please uh, send us your, your thoughts, your comments. Um, if anyone knows who was doing the political discussion um, with, with Mason, I think all of us would love to know that because now that's going to be sitting at the back of my mind for the rest of the week. So if, if you, if you know, or if you have a theory, please send it our way and, and we'd be happy to bring it up and discuss it. Um, so join us next week. Uh, and, and we will look forward to seeing you all then. And thank you so much for listening. Bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah, so I I wanted to talk to you about a brief history of Seven Killings because holy shit, that book, mm -hmm. like, 
I don't usually get book hangover, but I sure did after that. Yeah, yeah. And the thing that sucks is there's really nothing like that book. Like, you can't really say, well, if you're looking for something similar, then I would recommend reading this. It's kind of its own yeah. thing. Um, but why that book didn't win the Pulitzer for fiction that year is so beyond me. Yeah, I mean, it won the Man Booker, and they decided in, like, two hours. Um, yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, the Pulitzer is, is the Pulitzer. I don't know why they do what they do. But, yeah, that one was, you know, I kept, as, as bleak and depressing as it was, like, I could not put it down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Mar Marlon James is such a talented author. I, well, I picked up his, the first of his sci-fi series, um, so I'm Black Leopard, looking forward Red to Wolf that. Train. Yeah, yeah. So, but I had to, yeah, I had to kind of take a a lighter <laughs> turn after after Seven Killings and and read something lighter. And now, uh, some my my I'm trying to find ways to like get my kids to read more. And so the Barnes and Noble was doing like a reading challenge where if you read eight books over the summer, you get a free book. So. Oh, nice. I challenged my, my kids uh, that I, I was like, I bet I can read eight books before you can. And I'm already three in for the summer. So my daughter has jumped on this and she's like flying through this little uh, eight book series that she just got the other day. Um, and so this morning, because I finished my Brandon Sanderson book yesterday. Um, so this morning I was like, hey, you, do you want to pick the next book I read since I'm, you're challenging me on this? And so she's going through my bookshelf, like pointing at all the biggest books I have. <laughs> so like, do this one, do this one. I'm like, okay, well, to be fair, I've read that one. I've read that one. Mm -hmm. uh, but she ended up, what she picked for me uh, has been on my to read pile for forever. And I just haven't gotten around to it. And it, it, I have not been more engrossed by a book in a while. It's uh, The Magus by John Fowles. Oh, um, I've heard of it. I don't really know anything about that book. It's so good. I'm I'm almost a hundred pages in, and it's just the atmosphere of it has like his his writing is really interesting. Um, I've mm. only read one of his other books, the the Collector, which is one of the most disturbing things I've read. Um, because it's like a it's a book about a serial killer, but it's written from the killer's perspective, and it's done so well and so evocatively that it it's really disturbing um mm -hmm. but his prose is just so it works in such a way that i it's it's not overly complex it's just very conversational like even as a as a first person narrator it just has a very conversational flow to it so it it is really easy to get lost in it because it's just like having someone tell you this this story um but with this book, it's, I, and I haven't gotten far enough into it to really start getting an understanding of it, but um, it, ostensibly it's about a guy who is, he gets a job in Greece, uh, breaks up with this woman that he was in love with, but wouldn't admit that he was in love with her um, and leaves all that behind and then meets this weird uh, kind of outcast guy who said, will eventually trap him on an island and force him into this like survival game. Uh, full of like weird puzzles and stuff to get out kind of like a, a most dangerous game but with yeah. more psychological elements to it okay um it's it's really cool and from reading about like the 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 way it was written and everything i was kind of reading about the history of it and it apparently gets really weird to the point where it's hard to parse out uh where in the timeline things are happening and it's it's considered kind of an early postmodern novel um so i'm I'm really digging it. I'll probably end up finishing it pretty quick because it's, I mean, it's just a quick, brisk read, but it is, like, that's going to be what I go back to when we're done here is I'm just going to go sit down and keep reading that. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the page on Goodreads for it right now. A lot of my friends have read this book and they all liked it. Uh, so I will have to, to add this to my list to get around to eventually. That's really cool. It sounds interesting. It sounds almost like the movie the game but if michael Douglas apparently was actual it was a danger very, yeah it was apparently an inspiration for that film oh sure that makes so sense so that, that's i think that's kind of what probably drew me to it because I, I love that movie yeah that movie is is fantastic like as far as early fincher goes like you know it, it's before he kind of fully discovered his his film language i feel like but it's mm -hmm. really really good it's where the fincher that 
would eventually make all of the movies you know him for really, I think, started to emerge. Well, apparently he does not like it because um, I yeah. rewatched it like a month ago and he, he felt like the third act just really got shooed in, shoehorned in mm-hmm. and didn't care for it. I, I still I think the ending is great. I don't know how else it could have ended. I mean, you could, I suppose it could have ended in a way that is incredibly depressing. There's that's always, true. There, there's yeah. always that option. <laughs> um, but as far as like providing you with an ending that is both satisfying to the, the concept of the storyline while also, you know, giving you somewhat of a, um, of a satisfying conclusion just from a standpoint of, of not being depressing, I think it's, it's fine. I don't have any problems with the way yeah. that book ended. Not at all. No. But I think you're right. And, and it, it really was, I think, the first real good example of, of what he was capable of. I mean, obviously, Alien 3 was a studio mess, so I can't really hold that one against him. Have you seen um, the assembly cut of Alien 3? No. I would recommend it. It's the closest thing okay. to Fincher's actual vision before the studio mucked around with it. Um, it doesn't fix everything, but you can well, kind of uh, actually... Yeah. You can actually kind of see what Fincher would have been moving towards if he had been left alone. Um, it's pretty good. Okay. Yeah, because I Fincher is one of my favorite directors, and and when I think I, I I would personally say Zodiac was kind of his best. I think for me, I have a longstanding obsession with with unsolved serial killer cases, and Zodiac's at the top of that list now that Golden State Killer has been identified and captured. Um, but he, everything he did with that movie was so, so good. And I was actually reading an interview today with him where he was talking about that because apparently he still gets a lot of flack for focusing on the Graysmith, um, investigation and, and pointing at Arthur Lee Allen. And he was like, well, I mean, we can't, we couldn't dive into every single person because there's too many and we don't have, there's not enough time in a movie to capture every single voice. But at the same time, like you know, with the way that that the story played out that, you know, of Arthur Lee Allen was really kind of the only logical way to go with that and to yeah. use the other suspects as, as tension building. Like that scene in the basement where uh, he's talking to the film historian and he hears the footsteps. God, every time that scene is so tense. It just, oh, yeah. it's so good. Not many people in California have basements. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. That, oh. And I remember when I saw. Have you? Did you ever watch every frame of paintings uh, video essays when he was making stuff? No. I would recommend you go look up every frame of painting on YouTube. It was it was okay. this YouTube channel. Um, it, it was narrated by this guy named Tony Zhao, but he co-wrote all the scripts for the videos with another guy whose name is unfortunately escaping me right now. But he has two different essays on Fincher, if I remember correctly. One is about the way that Fincher moves the camera, um, but another one is about how Fincher uses visual effects. And he has a couple of breakdowns of Zodiac in that video that I think you'd find interesting, where okay. this the scene where um, the detective played by Mark Ruffalo gets out of the car and goes and looks at the taxi that has the Zodiac cipher written on the side of it. Um, yeah. Of the environment that him and the other guy are walking through is on a green screen. Like, that is not actually a real street at all. Yeah. Um, And that is one of the only cases where, like, I haven't been able to immediately tell. Like, usually you can tell if the entire environment is fake, even with how good CGI is now. But he breaks down how Fincher uses CGI in a way that actually makes it indistinguishable and there's a lot of different elements from zodiac that he specifically talks about um in in that video and the cool thing is he ended up working with fincher i guess there's this film essay series that was on netflix um that tony Zhao executive produced and wrote some of the scripts for but so did david fincher so like david Mm. fincher you know must have seen these essays that he put out or heard about them and actually gave this guy a shot to to further talk about film criticism um, and on a wider platform. So you'd probably really like those videos. Yeah, I'll have to check that out because I love his... Yeah, I, I do really appreciate the way he, he puts shots together. I think... Mm-hmm. I feel about him, I think, the way a lot of people feel about Wes Anderson. And, and I think Fincher doesn't get the same amount of recognition for, for framing that Anderson gets. I, Wes Anderson is really good at doing that. 
Um, but I think Fincher does it to, to a more effective and evocative ends. Um, I, I think his, the way he chooses to frame certain shots is so good at really building like the tension that he's known for and, and, and setting a lot of the moods that he, he wants to capture on there in a way that like Anderson, Wes Anderson is good, but is more of just like a, um, not so much a mood, but like an aesthetic, um, it's a pastiche. It's a pastiche. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, where, you know, like that opening shot of Zodiac where it's, it's following the car is and it's perfectly centered and you're you're taking those turn you know normally i think a lot of other directors would have just kept the camera straight and followed the car as it turned and you know we'd be seeing it going right but you know the the choice to turn the camera at the same age, everything about it you know like zodiac i think i remember seeing that in the theater and i was just blown away um but then he did the same things with like uh with girl with the dragon tattoo which i was really bummed that that didn't continue i understand why oh it didn't. my he god didn't don't even don't even get me started. I'm so pissed still that he wasn't able to make films two and three. It, uh, yeah. yeah. It really well, bugged. And, and to your point about David Fincher versus Wes Anderson, because I agree, um, whereas Wes Anderson is a pastiche, like, in my opinion, Wes Anderson isn't a director. He's the most talented set decorator and dresser that's ever existed. Yeah, um, that's, I'll agree. Whereas Fincher, the way that he actually shoots things is like the easiest way that I can describe it is that he he copies the way that your eyes naturally move in the way that he frames and films things. Um, I've seen and, this video that you just put up. The the yeah yeah okay where I've like he he illustrates how it is that um, you are you are already moving your eyes and looking at things uh, in order to take in the world around you. And he copies that in a way that's almost not recognizable, but yeah. is, is com completely changes the way that you actually view his films. Um, and I th this, this one, I believe, is the, the one about CGI that I found. Okay, cool. Very cool. But yeah, he is one of the most impressively talented um, directors still. I haven't seen Mank, but I've seen I everything seen else. Mank. Yeah, I have this. I love the score. That that soundtrack is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely.